<clears throat> okay, so I guess it was a year, more than a year ago now, uh, the FreeBSD turned 30 years old. It's just in about to turn 31. And so there was a big uh, special edition of the FreeBSD journal, and they got a whole bunch of us old geezers to write up about the good old days. And so I, my article in there is uh, FreeBSD at 30 years, its secrets to success. And I figured, well, you know, I wrote the paper. I might as well you know, do a talk based on it. And uh, so this will be sort of a little bit of history and a little bit of a lot of things that I've talked about over the years. But I didn't want it to be completely boring for those of you that have heard me lecture. And so at the end, I came up with some rather interesting statistics. So even if you sleep through the first 45 minutes, stay tuned for the end of this. OK. And uh, oops. I, I'm finally weaned off of my Apple laptop. I, I have a framework, and I actually use it most of the time now. Um, this is the first time that I've actually tried to do a presentation on it. And as you know, saw, it took me about 15 minutes to figure out how to get the right size image on the screen. But uh, it's here, so I, d I do have my Apple backup if I needed it, but I thankfully didn't. OK, so as I said, FreeBSD turned 30 in last year. And if you look at sort of uh, open source projects that have had long-term success, it's usually because it's being run, let's just say, by a company. That is, uh, you know, MongoDB ends up having a, a company that, that is selling it and therefore has a vested interest in making sure that it continues. And early on, this concept that a company's product would be open source, the standard comment was, well, how can you make money if you're giving it away? Uh, and one of the very first open source companies was one done by my husband called SendMail Inc. And uh, they had to fight a lot of that in trying to get venture capital. Uh, but they, they were successful. And the company itself no longer exists, but it got sold off to uh, Proofpoint, who still sells it as a product. FreeBSD is not in that same camp. Uh, there's no single company that have sponsored them over its entire lifetime. That being said, it has had companies, especially early on in its life, that really got it going and, and provided key infrastructure. So Walnut Creek CD-ROM was at the very beginning. Uh, there, they, what they do was they sell these things called CD-ROMs. I don't know if you remember what they were, but these little disks. And uh, they, the networks in those days, I mean, if you were unlucky, you had a 300 baud modem. Uh, I remember when Eric and I bought our first 1,200 baud modem for $975, which is thousands of dollars in today's money. Uh, and it was like a huge investment for us. But we had 1,200 baud, you know. The, the, the text came out a little faster than you could read it on the screen. Uh, anyway, uh, it was not really possible to download any large thing. So in those days, you had to do it with CDs. And so what would happen is that uh, a new release of FreeBSD would come out. And it would, and Walnut Creek would sell it. And you know, they had people with subscriptions. I have a subscription. I still have a subscription. So I have every CD of FreeBSD and DVDs, of course, today um, lining my shelf. And it actually, when I've been an expert witness, it's great because I, you, know, you want to prove that something existed at a certain time. I just pull this thing off. It's got a date of manufacture on it. I say, see, here's source code. Here's the date provenance for this source code. And yes, that patent didn't exist when this source code was written. Um, at any rate, Walnut Creek, uh, that, that mode of selling things uh, became obsolete by the end of the 90s, really, because the networks were fast enough that you could just download things. And so Walnut Creek ended up getting folded into some other operation. But the, in that early time, Walnut Creek was the one that was buying the machines that were you know, building the source and archiving the source and all that sort of thing. So Yahoo started up. And the folks that started Yahoo were big FreeBSD fans. And so all of Yahoo ran on FreeBSD. And so when the, the 
Walnut Creek was sort of winding down, Yahoo took over. So for a, a close to a decade, all of what you think of like free fall and the, you know, the, all the various machines that we have, well, not as many as we have today, but they were all hosted by, run by Yahoo, and the you know, FreeBSD was utterly and completely dependent on Yahoo. If Yahoo had decided you know, they were done with FreeBSD, uh, that would have been it. There, there, you know, there was no place else for that stuff to be stored. So Justin Gibbs uh, realized that you know, great as Yahoo was and as stable as they were, I mean, since the founders of Yahoo were the ones that were you know, making sure that that stuff wasn't going to go away, there wasn't any great concern at that time. But it's like, well, you know, what happens if Yahoo, you know, doesn't run forever or, you know, decides to go to Linux or whatever? And so Justin set up the FreeBSD Foundation. And really the goal, early goals of the FreeBSD Foundation were to have enough money so that they could buy and host and operate the, the, the core machines on which uh, FreeBSD is stored. And thankfully that was in place and the transfer over from Yahoo took a decade, <laughs> I'll just, just say. Um, the, 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 there was the, the free fall, the, the, sort of the, the one machine that had you know, legacy stuff that nobody quite knew how it worked but was the glue that held the project together. Uh, finally, the last little bits of that came over uh, you know, as sort of Yahoo was kicking the, the machines out the door. Uh, another early uh, company that, that use, used and still uses FreeBSD is Network Appliance. And they, early on, started providing money to the FreeBSD Foundation and continue to this day to do so. Um, so although you know, they, they don't have the role that Walnut Creek or Yahoo had, um, they have had a, a, a sustaining effort on making sure that the FreeBSD is still here. In more recent times, uh, Juniper, and Netflix. Uh, Netflix, of course, their content distribution system is all running on FreeBSD. Uh, they have a lot of active people, which is to say committers, uh, that uh, you know, make sure that you know, the, the stuff that they're doing and other things that are important uh, are continuously being uploaded. Uh, Netflix was one of the first companies that moved from the model of you know, getting a distribution and then just running on that. So Uniper, for example, uh, would, would sometimes get two or three releases back and then they'd have this huge uplift to get moved to a newer version of, of FreeBSD. Whereas Netflix sort of got into this thing of, well, we're just gonna be running head on our machines. I'm like, well, how can that possibly work? And they say, well, you know, we bring it down and then we just push it out to a few of our machines in the field that are doing production. And if they keel over, then uh, you know, <laughs> we know something's not quite right. Uh, and if it's working, then we keep going. But as far as I know, they're within a few months of the head of the tree most of the time. Um, ask Warner Losh. I mean, he'll, he'll give you all the gory details if you're interested. Uh, Netflix is much more willing to talk about what they do because they don't really have their IP in that. I mean, they sort of do because you know, suddenly there's all these other streaming companies that would really love to know how they do it so cheaply. But, um, you know. Generally speaking, their secret sauce is in other places. And Arm, of course, uh, is another company that has really felt that it's important to have not just Linux, but also um, BSDs on their, uh, on their design, on their chips. And well, it's not on their chips, because on the designs of their chips. Uh, and so again, they're, they're another company that's had a lot of sort of long-term uh, support. And this is just a very small list, and I'm sure I've missed some people, and you can come beat me up and make me put your company on that list later. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation, of course, has their donors page, so you can go see the, the much longer list there. OK. So the origin, the origin story. Uh, the, really, the genesis was the first decade of Unix coming out of AT&T. So 1970 uh, is the beginning of time, because that's when they started it. Uh, they uh, hadn't quite figured out that 16-bit time wasn't going to do it, but they pretty quickly got to 32-bit time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that 32-bit time runs out on my 84th birthday, <laughs> at least if I'm in the universal time zone. Not in California. It's off by the day there. But uh, at any rate, 
you know, we've pretty much moved into 64-bit time, but there's still a little bit of 32-bit time lying around. And uh, we're hoping that there's no nuclear power plants that are uh, running uh, you know, a 32-bit time file system uh, on that day, because uh, they'll suddenly think that it's sometime in the early uh, 19-teens. Anyway, um, the, sort of the next decade was the Berkeley BSD project. Uh, BSD actually started in 1978 uh, with Bill Joy, who was my office mate at UC Berkeley. And he had, did just utilities. So the, the uh, EX and VI editor, the C shell. I, I, I just want to point out that Bill Joy was getting a PhD in programming languages and came up with the syntax for C shell. There's got to be something wrong here. Um, at any rate, uh, those were just utilities at, that you would just add to your existing uh, Unix version 6 or 7, depending on what you were up to running, uh, Unix. So it wasn't until the VAX came out in 1979 that uh, BSD was expanded to be the whole operating system. Uh, an interesting story there, but I don't have time to really tell it today. But uh, so the, the first releases of BSD that actually were, had included a kernel uh, was the, the three BSD series. OK, so some of the things that got done in that initial period at Berkeley uh, was the socket networking interface. Uh, and then, of course, the original and very widely used, even to this day, uh, implementation of TCP IP. Uh, the set of system calls used to operate on file systems. You say, yes, but you know, AT&T's Unix had open, close, read, write, and seek. But they didn't have things like make dear and rem dear and uh, the whole open dir and read dir uh, stuff. All of that was actually done at Berkeley by yours truly. Um, and then the virtual file system interface, uh, originally there was the file system. Uh, and at some point, we realized, well, we needed remote file systems. And so we needed to, to essentially define another layer in the kernel, which is the, the VFS interface, so that we could support multiple underlying file systems. Uh, my original project, which was the FAST file system, uh, this is, I call this sort of a, a, a period of time, a greenfield period of time, because the existing Unix file system utilized somewhere between 4 and 6% of the bandwidth of the disk. And so it's really easy to come up with a file system that runs 10 times faster because you only have to get to half the bandwidth of the disk. When people that are trying to compete with the fast file system, you know, the best they can do is 2x. And uh, so you know, you've already grabbed the sort of, <laughs> it's not just the low hanging fruit, it's like sitting in a basket on the ground fruit. Um, the other thing was the NFS implementation. Uh, and, and that was sort of our first example of something to plug under VFS. Um, we also introduced the MMAP memory model. Again, we weren't the people that came up with this idea. That was uh, already in Multics. But uh, we defined what that interface was and, and actually started providing it. And the interface for managing processes. They're, again, the original Unix had things like signals, but they didn't have process groups or job control or any of that sort of thing. And so we really managed to set up a lot of sort of the core of what we think of as the, the you know, interface to operating systems today. All right, so distribution model of, of FreeBSD, it followed sort of the Berkeley BSD model which was this notion of a complete distribution. Again, I, you compare that to Linux. Linux itself is just the operating system. And then other companies wrap utilities and other things around it. Uh, and so you know, there's, you know, people say, well, there's only one true Linux. And it's true that you know, they, they all more or less agree what the Linux is going to be, although they all have their little extensions in them in there. Uh, but then they put other stuff around it. But if you go you know, from uh, you know, different distributions of Linux, uh, 
you, you will not have a, a uniform set of things there. Uh, so uh, the distribution model from Berkeley was you had the operating system, you had this core set of libraries and utilities, and then contributed software. We just called it contrib in, in FreeBSD, of course, it's ports. Uh, and the other thing was having complete manual pages and system documentation, and that really was already present in, in the Unix that was coming out of BSD. Uh, and in fact, it was, uh, it was a hallmark that there was so much more, uh, you know, essentially information about the system uh, in, in, the, in BSD compared to what you would get in a lot of other things that you would use. I mean, the early Linux distributions were pretty minimal. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, it was at a conference like this, I don't remember if it was BSD CAN, but uh, someone came up to me and said, well, I'd like to contribute to FreeBSD, but, you know, I, I'm a documentation writer. Is there anything I could possibly do? And I'm like, you. <laughs> and that's how the, the whole, uh, that, the, that whole branch of, of FreeBSD uh, got started. All right. Okay, so leadership. This is another really kind of key point. Uh, projects, open source projects, typically get started by somebody who becomes the czar for life of that project. You know, you go around at different projects and you'd say, you know, who's the, who's the czar for life? Uh, how many people can name the czar for life for Linux? Yes, starts with Linus, ends with Torvald. Um, and uh, the problem then is projects often just go dark when the leader loses interest. Uh, if you look at you know, projects on GitHub, uh, you know, you'll see like commits, 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 and then suddenly it'll just kind of tail off, and then there'll just be no commits in that project for years. Uh, and you know, that's essentially a dead project at that point. Uh, Sometimes someone will come along and like will revitalize and restart a project. That's been known to happen. But uh, a lot of projects live and die by the person that starts them uh, being involved with it. The other thing is if whoever's involved is not really good at reviewing and critiquing and accepting input from others, uh, the contributors get frustrated and move on to something else. And I hate to say it, but uh, you know, Early on, when, when FreeBSD was on GitHub, we were really terrible about dealing with pull requests. Um, just in the recent years, we're finally sort of getting our act together on that because, you know, people try and, can, you know, make suggestions. And a lot of them are just little, like, you know, fix this comment in here because it's, you know, misspelled word or something. But the fact that nobody was going around and pulling those in meant that we were viewed as, oh, well, that must be a dead project or whatever. And so, uh, you know, I'm really happy to see that we're really starting to, you know, I'm seeing a lot of commits coming in that are, you know, pull requests, and they aren't like from two years ago. You know, they're like from like a week or two ago. So good on that. Okay. Uh, so FreeBSD it started out with the, the uh, czar for life model. Uh, it started out being Bill Joy. Uh, and then it was Mike Carls and myself at Berkeley. And then eventually Mike went off to BSDI, and so I became the czar for life. Uh, and eventually got the, you know, got the open source distribution out after three years of a lawsuit. Um, the, the one side benefit of that is that uh, I, the university couldn't pay for a, a, a real expert, so I had to be the, the expert. And, uh, the lawyers actually found out that I was good at it, and so I have a second career as an expert witness now. Um, so, but let me say, it's a hard learning process. Okay, so uh, FreeBSD set out to have at least a core team, not just having a person. On the other hand, they were a core team for life. And uh, uh, the problem, of course, is that, you know, people get burned out, and you know, so you end up with dead wood and, and you know, the, the, the core team was getting a little creaky around the edges, but no one wanted to step down because, you know, there was the prestige of having the position. So uh, another long story that I won't tell, but uh, core became an elected thing. And so now, uh, you know, people come into core 
and uh, you, know, you have upward mobility. You, you can become one of core by, if you're a committer, you can run for core and you can get elected and mm. you can have all that power. Um, but really the point is that what's happened is that the sort of core teams have changed over time. And we've actually had sort of, loosely speaking, sort of three leaders, three core teams that really led and pushed the project forward in significant ways. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the people that come to FreeBSD come because they've sort of risen as far as they can through Linux and they've gotten, they've hit the ceiling. You know, you can't be Linus, you can't be one of his lieutenants, you know, and, and so you have to just try and figure out how to stuff things through. And they get frustrated and so they, can get, they get to FreeBSD in their late 20s uh, and by that time they've got at least a decade under their belts of how to write code, so they're pretty good at that. And uh, they've, they've gotten over the, the angst years where they have to have ad hominem attacks on mailing lists and things of that sort. And so we, we tend to have a pretty stable community of, of the people that are here. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Okay, so uh, because the leadership's been able to evolve over time, the project has been less susceptible to collapse when the leader departs. All right. Development, there's not a lot to say here. Uh, FreeBSD used source code control and bug reporting tools from the start. A lot of projects sort of didn't realize they needed those, and so they went for a while. I mean, if the <laughs> bug reporting tools in Linux in the early days was you sent email to Linus. Um, so the other thing is that uh, been very good at adopting code and ideas from other projects. I mean, why come up with a good idea when you can steal a better one? So, you know, NetBSD really focused on mul multiple architecture support. And the early, FreeBSD early on was like, all we care about is the PC. We want to just totally be focused on that and do, you know, easy to use distributions. You know, NetBSD was like, if you don't know how to download it from the net and build your system, then we probably don't want you as a user. They've thankfully gotten beyond that today. Um, but they really worked on the multiple architecture support. They wanted to run from everything from your microwave toaster to the Cray XMP. Uh, and they did a really good job of figuring out how you minimize the machine dependent stuff. And so when FreeBSD decided, well, you know, maybe there is something besides the PC out there that we want to run on, um, they, they went and pulled in a lot of that design from NetBSD. OpenBSD has done, I mean, security is their middle name, it's the first name, it's their last name. Uh, and you know, we track the changes that they're making because they have found some very, very subtle bugs. Um, and again, you know, we just pull those in. And of course, Open Solaris, uh, that's the, the origin of ZFS and DTrace. Uh, and any of you that haven't noticed, but uh, ZFS is actually uh, now in far greater use of FreeBSD installations than UFS. So it's, uh, it's been a very key driver for us. And the fact that the Linux community so hates it, I mean, the, the core developers of, of not the, you know, there's a lot of people out there using ZFS on Linux, but the, the Linux developers themselves wish it would just go away. And DTrace, of course, again, is just another uh, really revolutionary step forward in being able to do debugging. Okay. Distributions, again, pretty much said this. There's a complete distribution, including sources and binaries. Easy to use installation tools. People will argue about that, but <laughs> it, we, we're, we're up there. Uh, comprehensive documentation. We've fallen a little behind on that, but uh, uh, we're still in, in pretty good shape. Um, and the other thing about FreeBSD versus Linux is that, you know, Linux supports everything. You, you go get something, you know, any random thing that you, any piece of hardware you can find, you can plug in and Linux will have a driver for it. But FreeBSD, I mean, didn't have the resources to do that. So we would tend to curate hardware. We would say, all right, here's a set of things that we know work and we're going to put a lot of effort into the device drivers for these things. And so you would get a, like a list and it's like, you know, this is the machine you should buy, this is how much memory it should have, these are the disk controllers we recommend, et cetera, et cetera. And if you got that hardware, it worked. And the thing with Linux is some of the drivers are good, some of the drivers aren't good and, uh, you know, 
Now, I will say that things like Wi-Fi, we kind of fell behind the, the eight ball on that. Uh, for a long time, Wi-Fi was being done by Sam Leffler, who was great at it. We had a leading, bleeding edge uh, set of Wi-Fi support. But he ended up moving on, and it just kind of nothing happened because it worked so well for so long. But eventually, enough new hardware came along, and nobody was really doing it. In recent years, of course, the FreeBSD Foundation is now paying Bjorn to do a lot of the Wi-Fi work. We're beginning to catch up, but it's still kind of a sore point. OK, communication. Again, this seems like so obvious, but you know, a lot of projects don't think about it. And if you don't think about it, you get it wrong. Uh, so you set up uh, mailing lists and you know, IRC channels and so on for discussion, but you have to establish a culture of civil discussion. It, you know, it, ad hominem attacks can destroy a mailing list or an IRC channel in no time flat. So if, some, if you know, that kind of stuff comes down, somebody has to say, look, stop it. Go, you know, don't do that. Um, now, you have to evolve rules to adapt to the evolving culture and worldwide customs. We had this whole thing of let's you know, get a, uh, a set of things in place to, to you know, establish what, what the culture ought to be, what the discussion ought to be. Uh, and the problem was that the people that were doing that were living in North America, and they sort of set North American standards. And there's a lot of other parts of the world where some of those things just didn't fit. And so we got a lot of pushback, and they were like, look, you, can, you, you can't say things like this, you know. And so uh, the harassment policies sort of evolved over time. Uh, what we learned was don't do it yourself. You know, there's other organizations, worldwide organizations, that have done these policies. And you should start with that and maybe tweak it a little bit, but don't, don't start with a clean slate of paper and you know, get some people that have some PhDs in what they think it ought to be which is what we started with. So uh, the project is on a, on a much more even keel now that we got a lot of those things sorted out. Uh, and, but it is something where harassment policies are things that you need to keep on top of. Uh, and that's not just at conferences. It's also on mailing lists and IRC channels and other things. OK, documentation. I, I alluded to the fact that the, the doc committers uh, got a group early on. And I, I, when, when they, they started up, it's like the, the, you were a source committer. I mean, there was nothing other than source. Well, actually, ports came along fairly early as well. I said, we really need to have a separate group for the people that are doing documentation. So there's going to be doc committers, and they have to have equal standing with you know, it's not like, well, I'm a source committer, so I get two votes, and you know, they only get one vote, or any of that kind of nonsense, which, believe it or not, was proposed. Um, and uh, the other thing was to encourage the code and documentation writers to work together. And so like the doc people would, uh, they'd be looking at some code and trying to document it, and they wouldn't understand exactly what was going on. And you know, the source people were like, well, it's not my job to do blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, no, you work with these people. And because, you know, they were like section nine of the manual, which didn't exist in the early days. Uh, you know, this, this is actually important stuff. And it needs to be right. And you need to help them get it right. Uh, and the other thing that the doc people did early on was to set up a framework for the documentation to support multiple languages. So, you know, you look at our documentation and uh, it, it supports a long list of languages. Now, some of them are not very well supported, but uh, the, the, the point is that even people in some of these countries that have uh, less widely used languages can still you know, make contributions to, uh, to FreeBSD in you know, at least getting the documentation for their language uh, into our system. OK, the ports collection. Uh, again, this is something we had contributed software at Berkeley. And uh, right at the start of, of FreeBSD, they decided to create this thing. Instead of calling it contrib, they called it ports. 
and uh, maintained it to ensure that they actually compiled and ran on FreeBSD. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, what would early on what would happen is that you, you'd have to keep making changes and changes and changes uh, to, to keep them running on FreeBSD. And so the concept that you need to upstream your changes is an important thing to do. And so what the ports people you know, sort of took in their charter as to the extent possible upstream things. Because if it's just there, first of all, they're aware of it. And second of all, it's just there. You don't have to keep doing it every time a new version comes out. Another huge step forward was the folks that implemented the packaging system uh, so that you no longer need to compile everything. Uh, and the other thing that, at least for me, is a huge win is that tracks and installs the needed support libraries and utilities. Like, you know, I want to install, you know, a browser. And God, I mean, the list of things that goes in, it's, it just goes streaming off my screen. It's like, I'm so glad I didn't have to figure that out. Uh, and, you know, keeping track of when updates need to be done. And the, the port error system that, so that, you know, people, you know, like Netflix or others that want to keep, keep a set of things that they actually build for their distributions, uh, you know, it, it just makes that possible. So thanks to all the people that did all that stuff. OK, again, I've sort of alluded to this already, uh, but the port documentation development committers all give an equal say in running the project. Uh, we encourage the play well with others culture. Uh, one of the things that all open source projects that want to have a long lifetime, they need to pre keep bringing in new participants. Uh, we've somewhat fallen down on that uh, in the last decade period of time, although uh, we have been involved in things like Google Summer of Code since it started. Uh, our project has... I, either the most or the close to the most number of uh, participants lifetime of the Google Summer of Code. Uh, thankfully, the, the person that had been kind of coordinating all that got burned out, and the previous D Foundation stepped up and has, uh, you know, is providing the, the, the sort of uh, administrator, I guess they call it, for the Google Summer of Code that, you know, makes sure that the, you know, everything keeps on that timeline. Uh, my husband's sister, Kat Allman, ran the Google Summer of Code for 15 years at Google um, before the open source group was all laid off a couple years ago. And uh, so, you know, I used to sort of have a back channel with her and say, so, you know, how's the FreeBSD project going? And it's like, oh, God, this summer we had like two, pe two of our people dropped out and you know, and about, only about half of them really did a, a successful project, and I'm feeling really bad about that. And she goes, oh, no. <laughs> Most projects, they, they will never drop anybody, no matter how, you know, how awful they are, because they, they don't want to lose them. It's like, we, are, we understand that, you know, that not everybody is going to succeed, and we like it when you, you know, cut people off. That's why we give you so many more slots than we give uh, these other groups. Uh, and the fact that, you know, <laughs> Only half were successful? Are you kidding? We're lucky. Like 25% across all of Google Summer Code is, is successful. So we're doing something right because we are doing a lot of Google Summer of Code projects. And we're, especially in more recent years, gotten a lot better at bringing the, the, at least the successful projects in and getting those people to join the project and become committers, et cetera. Um, so keep it up. And we also, of course, need to find new channels for, uh, you know, bringing new people in. So be welcoming to new folks. Have a well-documented process. If someone wants to say, how do I get involved with FreeBSD? It shouldn't be hard for them to find out how to do that. It should be on the web someplace. Preferably, there should be a TikTok video on that. OK, uh, again, I've sort of talked about this, project support. We had to set up a foundation to, to uh, provide the project infrastructure, uh, raise money. <laughs> You've heard about raising money today. Well, they're, they, BSD can is not the only people trying to raise money. Uh, also providing a legal entity. Uh, it, you know, a lot of companies want you to sign NDAs if you want to get the details of how hardware works. 
and they are uh, hesitant to just sign it with an individual. They really like to have sort of a corporate body that does that just because that's kind of the way they're just set up. You know, they, they know how to sue a corporate body. They don't really know how to sue individuals you know, if they don't do what they want. Uh, so, and, and, you know, holding copyrights, et cetera. And so that's one of the early things that the project was able to do, because that's not actually terribly expensive to do. Uh, but, you know, you need to have a lawyer that can, you know, make sure that things are being done right, et cetera. And then in that way, the foundation will sign the NDA, and then the foundation will be responsible for find, identifying the, for you know, some developer that needs to have this information about this device. Uh, you know, so we'll essentially provide the vetting of that person. They'll say, well, you know, this, this person has agreed to you know, follow the terms of the NDA. And if that person violates the NDA, it's the foundation that ends up getting sued. Um, so it's up, you know, the, it, it's in the foundation's best interest to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay. And of course, you've already heard, at least in the developer summit, uh, from the foundation. So I assume most of you know what the FreeBSD Foundation is and does. All right. Licensing. The use of the Berkeley license is important. Again, I don't think I need to tell you these, but. Uh, the thing is with the, the GPL is that companies that have their IP in something that's GPL are in theory required to give that away. And so FreeBSD does especially well where the companies have their intellectual property in the kernel. Because if they put their intellectual property into Linux, then in theory they need to give that away. Uh, and so, you know, you, you look at like network appliance, you know, their waffle file system is in the operating system. And so, you know, and that's, that's their bread and butter. So they're not going to want to give that away. So they use FreeBSD for that reason. Juniper, same thing. A lot of the, the routing stuff is in the operating system. Okay. Certainly, the Berkeley copyright is a lot more comfortable for companies. You know, the lawyers don't look at it and, and, and have their eyes, eyes start going in circles. Uh, and uh, there's less fringe politics. Now, just, just to you know, play a little on the fringe politics, uh, it, when Linus did, first did Linux, he did it under GPL version 2. And the companies eventually figured out how to get around that. Because the way they would get around it is they would get a patent on the, on the software, on the, you know, the software design. And then even if they gave the code away and people started using it, then they could go chase after them to pay patent fees. And so, of course, the, the, the GPL people said, well, oh, this sucks. And so that's where GPL3 came along, which says even if you have a patent, if you have a patent, you have to give rights to use the patent at no cost. Uh, and Linus kind of cottoned on to the, you know, maybe that's not the best thing to do with Linux. So although a lot of all of the utilities that they have uh, wrapped around it in the various distributions are mostly GPL3 now, like GCC, for example. But the kernel itself remains uh, GPL v2. Uh, but there's certainly folks within the Linux uh, team, uh, you know, lieutenants of Linus that are very much, uh, you know, it's got to be open, it's got to be open, it's got to be open. And so they've been playing these games where they change interfaces in the kernel and they declare this to be a GPL interface. So you're not allowed to use this interface unless you're, you know, you, you GPL whatever you're doing. And uh, they, they're trying to do this to force people like NVIDIA and others to, to give away sort of more of their stuff. And uh, it's not at all clear that legally that you know, they can really make that happen, that you can have a you know, the GPL interface can be actually a thing. Uh, I, I don't think it's really been tested in the courts yet, but you know, do you want to be the first company that gets to find out? <laughs> so anyway, for that reason, uh, we tend to get into FreeBSD and the other BSDs a lot of companies that, where they can't work within the constraints of GPL. So big win there. All right, so 
many of you have heard me rant on about all of these things before, and I, you know, I got to come up with something new that I haven't talked about in the past. Well, actually, this is not quite entirely new, but it's mostly new. So uh, I, I'm going to butcher his name, but Rodrigo Osorio uh, has been tracking commits since the start of the previous D project. And uh, he has up here at this uh, website, uh, you can download, um, there's some other files too, but these are the three that are most interesting. Uh, so one tracks all of the commits to source for uh, starting from uh, June of 1993, uh, ports, which didn't start until August of 1994, and then the dock, which didn't start until April of 1995. And I just sort of pulled out uh, the, the first four lines of the, the dock committers here just to show you what the format of the file is. So these are lines one, two, three, four, and it's for every month, so start this, in the month of June of 1995, there was one committer, uh, whoever this was, uh, and they did three commits. And then the next month, there were three committers, and they did 10 commits. Uh, and then you know, the month after that, there were two committers, and they did nine commits, and so on. So if you look at this, the sorts of things you can do is you can go through, and for, for every name, uh, you can say, all right, well, you know, by this time here, uh, this, this committer had done 18 commits. And so if you just go all the way through all of time, right up to today, you can calculate the total number of commits that any given committer has made, and you can get a, a, a bound of, you know, what period of time they were working. Uh, because, you know, they stopped committing, well, you can see that. Okay, so... This way, you can, I, I'm going to give you a bunch of stats, which I do yearly. And so, but the years that I run are June through May of the following year. Because since it started in June, that just seemed like a logical thing rather than trying to do January to December. OK. Uh, so what I, want, I did is how many commits in total are being made uh, by each of the three groups and in total? Uh, how many active committers do we have? Now, active committers, the definition of an active committer, more or less, has been they've done a, at least one commit uh, within the last 12 months. And there's these files that tell you, you know, who, who has access to do commits. But the problem is that those files have been not all that well maintained. There's periods of times where Core wasn't really paying attention and they weren't really taking people off those lists when they probably should have and other things like that. So this, the numbers that I have for active committers is they did something in that June to May period. If they didn't do anything in that period, then I don't count them as an active committer. So I'm just, in these statistics, you're going to say I'm following the strict rules as opposed to what you would get if you looked at the log files of who was allowed to commit. And then another thing which I've done for a while but I find kind of interesting is the committer ages. Uh, so I have, all right, I have the list of all the people in any given year that were active committers. Uh, and so what are their ages? Well, there's this file, uh, calendar slash calendar.freebsd. Uh, and when you become a committer, you're supposed to put an entry in there which includes what your date of birth is. Now, there's a bunch of people that, for various reasons, don't want their date of birth to be out in the world uh, for anybody to see. Uh, and so I, when I run it, I get a list of all the, committed, all the committed names that aren't listed in calendar.bsd. And I set, fly, send an email out to all of them and say, uh, I would like to know what your birthday is just for my purposes of statistics. I keep my own calendar file, which I won't give out to anybody other than in an anonymized way. Um, and so I have my own private calendar file, uh, which has several hundred entries in it that fill in for a bunch of people that don't have entries here. So in fact, there's only 18 committers lifetime that I don't know what their birthdays are. So these age statistics are actually pretty accurate. All right. So, what does it look like? Here is the yearly commits. 
So obviously the top one is the total number of commits uh, being made in any year, starting here in 95 and going all the way through. Uh, it should have been through today, but I didn't actually rerun these graphs. I did it last week when I actually had some free time. So the, the very last year here is slightly lower than it ought to be. OK, so we see in this bar here, the solid one, solid red, they, these are source commits. So there's a huge uh, spike, especially right here, where uh, the, the U, USL, AT&T approved version of our distribution came in. So they had to uh, put a whole, you know, just wholesale import a whole new base version of the system. Uh, so that spiked there, and then it went down. But it, it's been pretty consistent at around 15,000 uh, commits a year. Uh, ports started out very low, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing because we have more and more and more and more ports. Um, and then the documentation, there was a huge sort of spike here. This, this period in here is when all the international language stuff was getting done. You know, and now it's, it's down to kind of a dull roaring. Well, there's nothing happening. That's like still 3,000 commits a year. It's like, you know, that's non-trivial amount of stuff that's going on there. So, uh, you know, overall, we're doing well. You know, we, our total uh, commits are, are, are doing a good job of coming up. You, you do see the, the drop in here, uh, and that's the COVID period. I actually thought people would have more time to do commits in COVID, but I guess they were too busy doing other things. I don't know. Having fun somehow. OK, so there's your commits. Uh, the next one, whoop, no, no. Come on. No. Nope. Ugh. What in the world is going on? What have I done? Ah, okay. Okay, that's better. And now. Why am I stuck? No. How do I go on from here? Do I do? No. No. <coughs> Collecting statistics. Nope. That's going the wrong direction. I go forward. And then I go backwards again. Oh, yes, let's try those. Good idea. <laughs> ah, let me just try typing 16. Ha ha! <laughs> okay. So, you know, I'm still not quite used to this laptop yet. <laughs> It always has new and interesting ways of causing me inter interesting problems. OK, so active committers. Uh, you can see we, we spiked here uh, in the late teens. We took a big drop during COVID. We're beginning to recover again here. And I'm hopeful that the, the drop was mostly COVID. Uh, the, uh, the number of uh, source committers has, has gone up. It's been sort of sitting around 200. Again, we got this big drop here, but we are starting to pick up again. The number of ports committers has been pretty stable, but remember the number of ports commits that have been going on is uh, it's going up and up and up. So the ports committers are, are getting stressed because they've got more and more stuff to deal with with a fixed number of people. So uh, I'm actually much more concerned about that number needing to go up uh, than I am about the, the level of source committers. The other thing is, if you looked at the actual number of commits, we're still doing this, you know, an active number of commits. So the, the people that we do have are doing more, which again, that can be good to a point, but that's not a long-term strategy. Uh, and the documentation, unsurprisingly, as I said, this was you know, the period in here where there was a lot of international stuff, and that was just a lot of people, uh, you know, and then they're, they're down to sort of a, a more steady state here. So 
you know, overall the health is, is okay, um, but uh, again, when you start to see the ages, we stayed at a pretty stable age early on in the project. It's, it's rising a bit now, and so again, that tells me we, we need to be a little more active about bringing newer people in. Okay, now let's see if I'm going to have to continue typing numbers or whether it's going to let me. Nope. <laughs> All right, well, we know how to fix this. So, the top five committers. This is, this is kind of interesting to me. Um, you know, and, and you can see the periods of time here. Uh, I'm, if I try and pronounce some of these names, I'm just going to butcher them. So uh, I'll just point at them. Uh, you know, so here's somebody that, that was active from 2009 up until 2023. Uh, and you know, some of these people are active today. So two of these people are, are, you know, have done commits this month. Um, but you know, a lot of these people are, are more historic. Um, Sun Poet, I mean, 87,000 commits. I mean, that's, that's just mind-boggling to me. Uh, but you can see in the ports committers, they tend to have just enormous numbers here. Uh, and you know, many of these people have been around for a long time, but even so, you can see there's, uh, you know, well, Four of these people are active. One person has dropped out in 2020. And source commits, uh, I know two of you are in this room, uh, our top two here. Uh, and uh, Constantine Kibb uh, is, again, another person. He, these, these people have, you know, well, in case of uh, Warner, he's been around since 1996 and is still doing it. John's been around since 1999 and is still doing it. Uh, oh, Alexander, you're here. Um, you know, you, you've got a ways to do to, if you want to get up into much further up here. But uh, I'll also point out Jordan Hubbard, who is one of the people that started the FreeBSD project. He hasn't done a commit since 2004, and he's still number five all time in commits. Uh, because he just did, like, he was kind of it for a long time. Uh, I was trying to figure out some way that I could, you know, find a statistic where I could be in this. Uh, and I thought, well, at least, you know, having been, you know, the, the most number of years on the project. Um, but it turns out, you know, I'm, I'm about number eight for that. But I figure if I could take the, if the, if the statistics went all the way back to BSD at Berkeley, then I could easily win on that score, as could Mike Carls probably. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, again, it, 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 an interesting number. Okay, so ages. Uh, I'm going to have more detail on this one because it's one that I've been tracking for many years. Uh, this, so these are just median versus average, and they pretty much track. So for uh, the first decade of the project, we were just flatlined at an average age or median age of 30. Uh, and it has been going stepwise up since that time. Uh, now, part of the problem, as you'll see when I show you the more detailed statistics, is that you know, back when the project started, which will be the next slide, there was nobody over 42 that was on the project. Um, so at that point, this is May of 95. So this is the first full year that the project has been running. Uh, we've got a grand total of 48 committers. 10,000 commits had gotten done based you know, with those numbers. Uh, and the age is 30. And so you know, here you can see the graph. Uh, our, our youngest committer was 22. Uh, and and it's, you see, early on, the, the bubble really doesn't start until about 20, late 20s. And, and they're in their 20s and 30s. And there's a couple of these outliers here. I mean, the, if you cut off the last two, the oldest person working on FreeBSD is 36 years old. OK, so I'm going to go forward in 10-year in, uh, steps here. So the next step is where, where are we um, 10 years later? And so now we've, whoop, I didn't go forward. Oh, yes, right. 
Yes, OK. So 2005, uh, at this point now, we have jumped up to a total of 300 committers. We actually got up to 300 pretty quickly. Um, and 300 is pretty much where it has sat since then. Um, in that uh, year, or the total commits at, by that time was 300,000. Uh, and you can see we're still 31. Uh, so at this point, we actually have a couple of really young people with the 17 and uh, 19. Uh, but then, you know, the next ones aren't really until about 23. And the, the, the spike is still here. Uh, people in their late 20s and early 30s. But now we're beginning to see this tail sticking out over here. Uh, you know, so the, the, this three from the top is kind of me. So you're going to see this keep sneaking out here. And if we could just like throw away these top 10 or so here, we could drop this age dramatically. You know, so if us geezers in our 70s would stop being involved with the project, you wouldn't have this ever growing age thing. OK, so uh, moving on to 2015, um, we're back to sort of our, our, well, what do we have here? Total committers, 326. We've more or less doubled the number of commits by this time. The age has now gotten up into the high 30s. Um, we, we have really, again, the, the demographics don't start until uh, really their mid-20s. We still have a huge spike of people in their 30s. But now we've got a, a fairly large group of people in their 40s. And that's all the people that were 30s 10 years ago, but they're still involved with the project. And now they're up to here. And uh, yes, yes, I'm one of those ones out there. Um, so you know, part of the reason that we start to see the age going up is because we have this large set of people that didn't leave the project. They continue to be involved, but they you know, have the bad taste to get older by 10 years. Um, but we're still we're doing a really good job of bringing uh, new people in um, to the project. OK, so of course, the next one is going to be through today, uh, since we are very conveniently at the end of May. And so here, um, again, uh, we've got one person who's 21, Jake Freeland. And, uh, but then other than that, the next youngest one is 26, 26, 27. Uh, now, you're seeing here in the 30s, we're not doing as good a job of bringing people in it by this time, because we're not, I mean, we still have people in their 30s. But we, the, 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 that huge 30s group is here, and they're still here. That's good. The 40s group is here, and they're still here. And you know, it's people trailing out the end are still here. So um, the upshot of this is that, uh, you know, the, we, we still have 293 committers, so you know, overall we're doing fine in that regard. But we really, it's showing we really need to start getting an effort to start bringing in this demographic here. OK? I have one more slide. Actually, this was set up so I could space forward and back through it so you could watch the chart sort of go doom, doom, doom to the right. But I'm not going to be able to do that little demo for you, apparently. Um, Anyway, uh, let me just put in my near next to last slide. My conclusions, um, FreeBSD is still going strong after 30 years. I think our strength comes from having built a, a strong base in our code, documentation, and culture. I think that three-legged stool, all of those stool, uh, legs are important. Um, it has managed to evolve with the times. We have brought in new committers. As I say, that's an area we need to work on a bit more currently, but we've done well over time. Uh, we've had smooth transition through various leadership groups. Uh, and you know, again, I think more than anything else, that's the single most important thing that we need out of uh, the project, is to really have people that are focused. Uh, and that anybody, you, know, you can come in. And if, if leadership is something that's interesting to you, which it isn't to most people, but uh, if it is, you have the ability to, to become a leader of the project. Um, it, it fills a, an important area as an alternative to Linux. I mean, one of the big sales points for FreeBSD these days, I'm told by the people that go out and do this sort of thing uh, from the foundation, that uh, a lot of companies say, well, you know, Linux is so pervasive now that it's a huge target. 
And if all of our infrastructure depends on Linux and it goes down because of some you know, zero day hack, we are screwed. And these are people like the ones that are running the backbone name servers. Uh, and you know, so you look at the people running the backbone name servers, they run Linux, Windows, and FreeBSD are their three things. And uh, you know, like when Linux had that business with XZ, that didn't affect FreeBSD. And you know, that gets noticed. Okay, so that's essentially the next point. They, companies need redundancies, uh, and they also like to have something uh, that doesn't have quite as big a target on it. Okay, so for all these reasons, I think that FreeBSD has a bright future, and of course, I'm going to tell you that FreeBSD is awesome, but uh, you know, I have to do that. Okay, so let me just put up my. Uh, Question slide. Uh, the reference is the paper that's in the that uh, in the FreeBSD journal. They're actually, if you out at the desk there, they actually have some copies of that. So if by some reason you don't have a copy, uh, you, you don't actually have to go online to see it. Uh, that's my email. That's my website. I have a YouTube channel. You can my, the favorite video on there, other than the one of me giving a lecture about FreeBSD, is. Uh, how to demolish a building in four minutes. Uh, there, there was an apartment building across the street from where I live that they decided to tear down so that they could build something for uh, a bigger building, basically. And uh, so I just set up a camera out there as they munched it down over four days and then just edited it down to four minutes. So big machine goes munch, 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 dump, dump, dump into a truck, and it's done. OK, um, so I have. Zero minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes. For your um, eight statistics, have you been able to or have you tried to track the pull requests that have landed so that maybe you have people that have done that? So the, for the, the record, the question is, uh, have I done any tracking of the ages of the people for the pull requests that we've been bringing in? Uh, and the answer to that is no, because I don't have the, you know, I don't have any way of, of being able to figure out what their ages are. But that is an excellent point. Uh, if we actually do start counting some of that, um, it, it would effectively, I mean, they aren't committers, really, uh, but they might potentially become committers. So, yeah, that, that is a good way of potentially bringing new people in. Okay? Yes. Sorry, I'm. Um, they, well, that's an excellent suggestion. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the question is basically, uh, is there ways for people that are not part of the project to get more access to the more senior people, let's just say the committers, of, of FreeBSD uh, so that they would be able to you know, essentially get more interaction? and. Uh, the, the problem is that sort of the traditional path of that has been mailing lists. And mailing lists are not something that uh, the younger demographics use nearly as much as, as we do. So uh, yes, I think that's something that should probably be explored. OK. Well, I thank you very much. It's time for your break. And